Page 1. Evolution, Mark Ridley, 2004. Five parts, 23 chapters. Preface. The theory of evolution is outstandingly the most important theory in biology, and it is always a pleasure to be a member, facing in either direction, of the class that is fortunate enough to be studying it. No other idea in biology is so powerful scientifically, or so stimulating intellectually. Evolution can add an extra dimension of interest to the most appealing signs of natural history we shall see, for example, how modern evolutionary biologists tend to argue that the existence of sex is the profoundest puzzle of all, and quite possibly a mistake that half the living creatures of this planet would be better off without. Evolution gives meaning to the drier facts of life too, and it is one of the delights of the subject to see how there are ideas as well as facts within the disorienting technicalities of the genetics laboratory, and how deep theories about the history of life can hinge on measurements of the width of a region called Protosocumch 2 in the larval shell of a snail, or the number of ribs in a trilobite's tail. So great is the depth and range of evolutionary biology that every other classroom on campus must feel, as you can sort of tell, locked in with more superficial and ephemeral materials. The theory of evolution, as I have arranged it here, has four main components. Population genetics provides the fundamental theory of the subject. If we know how any property of life is controlled genetically, population genetics can be applied to it directly. We have that knowledge particularly for molecules, together with some, mainly morphological, properties of whole organisms, and molecular evolution and population genetics are therefore well integrated. Part 2 of the book considers them together. The second component is the theory of adaptation, and it is the subject of Part 3. Evolution is also the key to understanding the diversity of life, and in part 4 we consider such topics as what a species is, how new species originate, and how to classify and reconstruct the history of life. Finally, part 5 is about evolution on the grand scale on a time scale of tens or hundreds of millions of years. We look at the history of life, both genetically and paleontologically, at rates of evolution and at mass extinctions. Controversy is always tricky to deal with in an introductory text, and evolutionary biology has more than its fair share of it. When I have come to a controversial topic, my first aim has been to explain the competing ideas in such a way that they can be understood on their own terms. In some cases, such as cladistic classification, I think the controversy is almost settled and I have taken sides. In others, such as the relative empirical importance of gradual and punctuated change in fossils, I have not. I am well aware that not everyone will agree with the positions I have taken, or indeed with my decisions in some cases not to take a position but in a way these are secondary matters. The book's success mainly depends on how well it enables a reader who has not studied the subject much before to understand the various ideas and come to a sensible viewpoint about them. The great, or at any rate, one of the great, events in evolutionary biology as I have been writing the third edition is the way genetics is becoming a macroevolutionary, as well as a microevolutionary, subject. Historically, there has been a good working distinction between evolutionary research on short and long time scales of between micro and macro evolutionary research. The distinction was one not simply of time scales but of research methods and even institutionalized academic disciplines. Genetics, and experimental methods generally, were used to study evolution on the time scale of research projects of a few years, at most. That work was done mainly in departments of biology. Long-term evolution, over approximately 10 a 1,000 million years, was studied by comparative morphology in living and fossil life forms. That work was done more in museums and departments of geology or earth sciences, than in biology departments. 
I see the distinction between micro and macro evolutionary research as breaking down, in perhaps three ways. The first is through the use of molecular phylogenetics. A phylogeny is a family tree for a group of species, and they were classically inferred from morphological evidence. Molecular evidence started to be used in the 1960s, but it somehow wrapped itself, I caricature a little, in about 20 years of obsessive behavior, as a small number of case studies of particularly human evolution were endlessly rehashed. Molecular phylogenetics broke out into life as a whole during the 1980s, and the result has been a huge increase in the number of species for which we know, or have evidence concerning, their phylogenetic relations. The research program of molecular phylogenetics may have been established for almost an academic generation, and it is certainly flourishing, but it has still only just begun. A recent estimate is that only about 50,000 of the 1.75 million or so described species have been put in any kind of menetria that is, a phylogenetic tree with their close relations. Cindy Brenner has remarked that the next generation of biologists has the prospect of finding the tree of life, something that all previous generations of post-Darwinian biologists could only dream about. In Chapter 15 we look at how the work is being done. The new phylogenetic knowledge is not only interesting in itself, but is also enabling many other kinds of work that were formerly impossible. We shall see how phylogenies are being exploited in studies of coevolution and biogeography, among other topics. The other two ways in which molecular genetics is being used in macroevolutionary research are more recent. I have added chapters on evolutionary genomics, chapter 19, and evodivo, chapter 20. The addition of these two chapters in part 5 of the book is a small symbol of the way macroevolution has become genetic as well as paleobiological. In my first two editions, part 5 was almost exclusively paleontological. The introduction of new techniques into the study of macroevolution creates an excitement of its own. It has also resulted in a number of controversies, where the two methods, molecular genetic and paleontological, seem to point to conflicting conclusions. We shall look at several of those controversies, including the nature of the Cambrian explosion and the significance of the Cretaceous tertiary mass extinction. This book is about evolution as a pure science, but that science has practical applications in social affairs, in business, in medicine. Stephen Plumby has recently estimated that evolutionary change induced by human action costs the U.S. economy about $33 a $50 billion a year, Plumby 2001 a. The costs come from the way microbes evolve resistance to drugs. Pests evolve resistance to pesticides, and fish evolve back against our fishing procedures. Palumbi's estimate is approximate and preliminary, and probably an underestimate. But whatever the exact number is, the economic consequences of evolution must be huge. The economic benefits of understanding evolution could be proportionally huge. In this edition I have added a number of special boxes within chapters, on evolution and human affairs. The examples I discuss are only a sample, which happen to fit in with themes in the text. Bull Witchman, 2001, discuss many further examples of applied evolution, from directed evolution of enzymes to evolutionary computation. The book is intended as an introductory text and I have subordinated all other aims to that end. I have aimed to explain concepts, wherever possible by example, and with a minimum of professional clutter. The principal interest, I believe, of the theory of evolution is as a set of ideas to think about, and I have therefore tried in every case to move on to the ideas as soon as possible. The book is not a factual encyclopedia, nor, primarily, a reference work for research biologists. I do not provide many references in the main text, 
though in this edition I have referred to the sources for the examples in formal scientific reference format. For readers who are unfamiliar with this format, I should say that references are given in the way I wrote Palumbi, 2001a, and Bullwichman, 2001, in the previous paragraph. The reference has the author's, or author's, name and a date. In the reference list at the end you will find the full bibliographic details, listing the authors alphabetically. There is also a convention for papers with multiple authors. When a paper has more than two, or three, with some publishers, it is referred to by the name of the first author with an et al. and the date, Lazo's et al. 1998, for example. The et al means and others. It is a space-saving device, and is abbreviated to avoid problems with Latin declension. For instance, if the reference is the subject of the sentence the full version would be Lazo Zeta I, 1998, studied lizards. But other phases require other full versions, the work of Lazo Zeta Iorum, 1998, or the work by Lazo Zeta Alaeus. 1998. In all, L could stand for 12 A18 full versions. Anyhow, all the authors are usually listed in the main reference list. I say usually because some authorial teams have grown so huge that they are not all given. Blackwell House style is that for papers with more than seven authors, the reference list has the first three and then an et al. Although I have referred to the specific papers under discussion in the text, I do not give general references there. The reason is that I do not want to spoil the most powerful textual positions, such as the end of a paragraph or a section, with a list of further reading. The way I have things, those textual positions can be occupied by summary sentences and other more useful matter. The further reading section at the end of each chapter is the main vehicle for general references, and for references to other studies like those in the text. I have referred to recent reviews when they exist, and the historic bibliography of each topic can be traced through them. In summary, this new edition contains 1. Two types of box a one featuring practical applications and the other related information which supply added depth without interrupting the flow of the text. 2. Margin comments that paraphrase and highlight key concepts. 3. Study and review questions to help students review their understanding at the end of each chapter, while new challenge questions prompt students to synthesize the chapter concepts to reinforce the learning at a deeper level. 4. Two new chapters a one on evolutionary genomics and one on evolution and development bring state-of-the-art information to the coverage of evolutionary study. There is also a dedicated website at www.blackwellpublishing.com slash Ridley which provides an interactive experience of the book, with illustrations downloadable to PowerPoint, and a full supplemental package complementing the book. Scattered margin icons indicate where there is relevant information included on the dedicated website. Finally, my thanks to the many people who have helped me with queries and reviews as I have prepared the new edition of Theodore Garland, University of Wisconsin Michael Whiting, Brigham Young University William Brown, SUNY Fredonia Jeff Oxford, University of York CP. Kiriakou, Leicester University Chris Austin, University of North Dakota David King, University of Illinois Paul Sproul, University of Montana Daniel J. O'Connell, University of Texas, Arlington Susan J. Mazur, University of California, Santa Barbara Greg C. Nelson, University of Oregon and to those students, now evil cyst at Oxford rather than a and 362 or bio 462 at Emory, who, perhaps not on purpose, inspire much of the writing. Mark Ridley Page 26